all of it has put diversity front and center. I mean, this is a situation where we can train every single person who serves on a search committee around mitigating bias, which doesn't mean we'll do it completely. You know, that we're, we're all trying. That's an issue for all of us in faculty affairs and academia. Um, but every person has gone through training. And I feel like that makes that a um, given conversation for every search committee. And I do think that that has uh, helped us recruit a faculty that's more representative of the U.S. population, which is really what we'd hope to do. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Development in the School of Medicine at Johns Hopkins University. And on today's episode, I'm so pleased that we have Dr. Maureen Connolly. Dr. Maureen Connolly is the Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Community Affairs at Kaiser Permanente's brand new Bernard, or is it Bernard or Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine? Yeah, it's uh, Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine, who was the CEO of Kaiser Permanente and Died suddenly this spring, uh, shockingly uh, for all of us, I, um, and it's been a tremendous loss, and we're grateful to carry on his legacy in the name of the school, and I should actually say uh, we lost him in the fall, not the spring, so uh, he's an amazing person with a real vision for this school as part of the larger community of what Kaiser Permanente is. Um, we have a lot to live up to. Oh my goodness, that, that's a shock. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. Why don't you um, set the stage? I know a lot, a lot of us know and have admired and, and been friends with you and colleagues for years, but some people may not know your story. Can you just kind of do a quick overview of um, your journey and that what got you to this uh, new position? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, so I'm a general internist by training, uh, Boston born and bred. So I trained up and down the East Coast for a good 15 years. But I ended up back at Harvard Medical School back in the days of the dinosaurs, I'd say, uh, for about 25 years. I did my fellowship there in general internal medicine and my MPH and stayed on in an academic department of population medicine. I was very interested in women's issues in the medical school and joined the Joint Committee on the Status of Women. Um, that's where I started to think more about administration. We did a survey of all the faculty at Harvard to understand the experience of career satisfaction for faculty, and that was sort of a springboard for me into faculty affairs. So I spent 13 years at Harvard starting as assistant dean and for the last eight, uh, dean for faculty affairs, where we really focused both on faculty development and faculty affairs uh, issues. And um, I was very fortunate to be given the opportunity to join Marsha Kinstrup of the Permanent Day Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine as they're getting it off the ground. Um, we are welcoming our first class this July, which is very exciting. And so um, about 18 months ago, I decamped to the West Coast after having been in L.A. one day in my life before I interviewed for this job. Uh, and it's been really an extraordinary opportunity. Uh, both my positions have been. I mean, I, I will just say, and I think you share this, uh, working in faculty affairs is an extraordinary privilege. I love what I do every single day in both these roles that I've had at two different schools. And um, so it's great to be able to share with you today uh, sort of some of my experiences and and to learn from this podcast with so many of our colleagues uh, yeah. joining you. This has to be a, a new job is, is challenging enough, learning the culture, learning the people, um, understanding what what are what are the you know difficulties what are the strengths and getting to know the players i can't even imagine what that must be like or how many factors that you you, you multiply this by when you were in a brand new school how did that happen yeah, you know um Obviously, those of us who are at school on the legacy have sort of walked into our roles with a tremendous amount of history about uh, how we got to where we are and, as you said, culture uh, that uh, we join. And it's very different at a brand new school. Uh, Kaiser Permanente is a very interesting organization. I've had the privilege of collaborating. Over the years, through my prior role uh, in the Department of Population Medicine, I don't know a lot about it, but what I didn't know when I came is the long. Um, the tradition that they've had in um, medical education. So they have students from all over the country rotating through here. They have residents in a very extensive graduate medical education program. So the idea that they were starting a medical school isn't quite as foreign um, as you think. Uh, but it, it, people have been thinking about this school for 10 years. So it was not absolutely you know, ground zero uh, when I started. Um, but there were so many things to think about and things we take for granted, whether it's a faculty data system or an infrastructure for faculty development. These were all you know, new things for us. Um, 
and uh, we had a chance to kind of shape it the way we would like. So um, among the things, you know, we had to think about were how do we um, help individuals who've been teaching students who come from other schools to start to think about themselves as part of their own school. Um, how do we get them to connect uh, when the practice space or the research space at Kaiser Permanente really has a different ethos, understandably, because the, the goals there are so different. Um, and we've been bringing people together. Where uh, One thing that's been remarkably different has been the rapidity with which we have to recruit faculty. Um, we will ultimately have in the five to 600 faculty range because there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching that's targeted in our school. And um, that's just a lot of people. We do searches where we're hoping to, you know, recruit 56. And that's a lot, very different from anything I've experienced in my prior role. Um, when, before I came, uh, the 22,000 physicians at Kaiser Permanente, uh, there was a survey done and over 7,000 of them said they'd like to be in the faculty. So we have a pool of incredible candidates, which is great. Uh, you know, wonderful people to choose from, many who've had academic experience, leadership experience, and they are primed and ready ready to go. Um, but we also have people who really haven't had a lot of experience on a faculty. And so this is our chance to sort of help get them up to speed as to what it means uh, to contribute in an academic environment. Unbelievable. It's fun. I'll tell you, you know, it's never boring. And I think you'd say the same for faculty affairs. There are so many dimensions to what we do. Um, but it certainly um, has been exciting to meet new colleagues and the uh, the sort of gleam in people's eyes about starting a medical school. What a privilege. And, and that's part of what drew me here was the privilege of thinking about an endeavor where hopefully you get some things right from the start as opposed to retrofitting, um, which is what we often do when we have tradition and legacy that we are working within. So um, that's that's been a great opportunity. So before I forget, I, so I'm thinking two questions. So first, of course, operationally, how do you build a team? Do you even have a faculty mm -hmm. development, community affairs, faculty affairs team in place? You know, did you recruit internally, externally, a combination of both? And um, you said something really important, and that was, you know, this isn't one opportunity to get it right, to maybe um, mm -hmm. not make some mistakes through the years, through you know, you're being an academic your whole entire career and working in leadership. Can you, um, the second part of my question was, can you reflect on or share with us any of those, okay, great, this was my one time to make sure that uh, I'm making something up that, that will be really transparent around promotion mm -hmm. opportunities or um, startup packages would look like this or mentoring might look mm -hmm. like that. I mean, so those are the kind of two things that popped in my oh. head before I forget them. <laughs> you know, those are great questions. Um, so in order to, to sort of build an officer of faculty affairs, we had to think what are the critical elements and how does one right size that to the size of the faculty? Because we may have 50 when we start, but we'll have 10 times that if we are successful over a two year period in recruiting. So, um, you know, to me, there are some really core components and I know you've, thought about this and talked about this uh, of, you know, what you need to have, you need to have data capacity within an office. There's lots of reporting to be done. There's lots of uh, dashboard type information that needs to be made available internally. Um, so you have to have fairly sophisticated tools and people who know how to use them. You need people who are going to be the face of the office. I think of faculty affairs offices as service offices. I mean, we're there to um, put ourselves out to the faculty and help them. So, um, we have had a sort of innovative position, I think, an academic career advisor was brought on a PhD um, in sociology who has joined us after experience at multiple liberal arts institutions. And her job is to try to ascertain what are the faculty's needs around their own personal career development. And she works in parallel with a faculty case developer, another um, person who's about to get a PhD, um, who is teaching our faculty how to teach with the various types of pedagogical approaches we're taking. So that's uh, one of the other things that we is having the chance to innovate in that way. And, um, you know, we have staff who are going to support the faculty governance structure, which is essential. And as you, you know, 
standing up nine standing committees. You need uh, infrastructure to make that happen. And then over all of that, you know, a director who kind of can see the integrated whole is very important. So we've brought some people in from Casa Permanente, other schools, other medical schools, and we have a pretty lean group. I mean, really four positions in the office at this point. And, um, but we partner so closely with the medical education office, um, with the library, with, you know, other resources in the school, uh, so we're taking advantage of the sort of growing collective there. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's a bit about how we structure the office. And then just to say the the issue that you raise about getting it right out of the box, which I will admit freely, we won't completely by any means. You know, there's plenty of chance uh, to not go in the direction that we hope. But there are some areas that I just feel like we have the opportunity to pay really close attention to. So a lot of our recruitment has, um, all of our recruitment, not a lot, all of it has, put diversity front and center. I mean, this is a situation where we can train every single person who serves on a search committee around mitigating bias, which doesn't mean we'll do it completely. You know, that we're, we're all trying. That's an issue for all of us in faculty affairs and academia. Um, but every person has gone through training. And I feel like that makes that a um, given conversation for every search committee. And I do think that that has uh, helped us recruit a faculty that's more representative of the U.S. population, which is really what we'd hope to do. I also think when you have a new culture, you can integrate expectations around faculty development. So it's not that it's optional or if you get to it, you could say there are some things that we as a community are going to agree we all need to understand. Bias training is an example of that. A general orientation is an example of that. Um, thinking about Title IX, these are things that we have agreed to as a leadership team everyone will do. And I think when you make that an assumption, it uh, becomes baked into the culture. Uh, and then you brought up a very important point about do we have some opportunities or flexibility and think about faculty promotion. And we certainly do. We've tried to draw our criteria very broadly in terms of recognizing a variety of forms of scholarship. Um, I'll be putting this podcast on my CV, for example. You know, this is, uh, we want to recognize all the ways that people reach out um, to support health and well-being, not just in academia, but in um, communities, lay communities. So, uh, you know, that was one of the most exciting and fun parts for me was thinking about the criteria in a somewhat broader sense and recognizing um, something I've learned through the AAMC, frankly, conferences I've gone to, that if we can't link our promotion criteria to our mission, then they're completely disconnected. Mm -hmm. And we really need to build criteria that reflect where the school wants to be as a community and culture. So doing that has been really fun. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing how it resonates as our faculty yeah, move up I, the ladder. That's just so key, isn't it? Linking mission to faculty mm -hmm. advancement. I mean, that is, yeah. the, you know, you've hit upon that. That's the, the crux of a lot of our um, faculty discontent is this uh, mm -hmm. sometimes that, that mismatch or that, you know, not, not meeting of the minds. If you're expect me to be generating RVUs and seeing patients and um, also coming up with grant funding and tons and tons of papers. And um, it's, it's becoming even more and more apparent that we, you know, we have to be more flexible at Hopkins. We just, just last year came up with a new pathway to promotion, clinical excellence, because it had always been at the traditional mm. research-based yep. one track, which, which allowed for um, other clinical and educational and program building opportunities. But it was, you know, perceived that it was not, um, it was not inclusive of our clinicians who, you know, again, their mission, if you're talking about that, you know, matching and linking mission is, uh, is seeing patients. And so that uh, feeling left behind in opportunities for being promoted and seeing fantastic, you know, world renowned faculty members who are assistant professors um, was just unacceptable. And so I, I like what you're doing at Kaiser is that recognizing that we have to be in faculty affairs and development nimble enough to um, to be to be make sure that we're not so entrenched in some traditions. Of course, tradition is wonderful, yeah. but to our expense of meeting new generations and new needs and evolving priorities. Well, I'll just say we're learning a lot from you and what's been going on at Hopkins. Uh, in thinking about recognizing clinical excellence. And I, I'm not 
suggesting we've got that all figured out by any means, but clearly we're bringing a lot of excellent clinicians onto our faculty and finding that sweet spot between clinical contributions and other academic contributions and making sure people get the appropriate recognition is a challenge across the board in faculty affairs. Um, but at least for on, in our situation, we get to think of it sort of from the get-go. So uh, we are asking everyone to um, submit a narrative that describes what they do in support of the mission of the school. So it puts their work in the context of what we're trying to achieve achieve. And I think that um, gives them a sort of path to follow. I often say promotion criteria are like behavior modification tools for people who care about being promoted. They will follow that lead. So if you say, why don't you start by telling us where you fit within our mission? Mm. And then we'll go from there. I hope that that will help faculty feel like what they're doing is meaningful Mm. Uh, to the community and that they can make the case that it is. So, um, but I will say I'm very excited about what you're doing, Hawkins, <laughs> because you, you've been leaders in this and uh, we're learning a lot from you. Well, so. it's nice, but I, I love how you are um, leading with building a culture where you're setting expectations around that, that mission, leading with mission, because, you know, you know mm-hmm. Tate Shanafelt's work with burnout. That if we're not spending, you know, twenty percent of our work week doing things that are that we're passionate about, uh, we're more likely to be burned mm-hmm. out. So it sounds to me like if you've decided that this is part of the the Kaiser culture, leading with mission first. Mm-hmm. My gosh, you know, it sounds like you're going to head off a lot of that that sense of disconnect, that sense of isolation, or you know, not fitting in because you're making that transparent right up front that no, we're all about this mission and. And I love that you've yeah. embedded that in the expectations around annual reviews and, and sound probably mentoring as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, it, um, it's kind of easy to buy into the mission. I mean, it's values that so many of us espouse in healthcare and medicine and science. Um, there's a very strong, uh, I mentioned the focus on diversity, but on sort of connecting with community, healthy populations, you brought up Tate Shanafeld and well-being is uh, sort of baked into our DNA, um, both at Kaiser Permanente as a clinical environment, but also in the school. So um, it's great to think about those things. And we've learned so much. I just want to say the school is very innovative um, in that it's bringing lots of new approaches together, but um but not innovative, in meaning we've learned from our peers. There's nothing that we're doing that in isolation hasn't maybe been tried in other settings. It's just we're able to kind of bring all those different pieces together in this one environment and we'll probably all play, whether it's certain pedagogical approaches, um, physical space. You know, we're doing anatomy, for example, without cadavers. And we're, uh, you know, we don't have tenure here. So thinking about multi-year contracts and things like that. There's just lots of ways. We're doing things differently, learning from institutions around the country who have made you know, real groundbreaking work in different areas. So that's, um, that's kind of fun to yeah. be able to learn from our peers and see how it plays. Here. Well, you're you're always humble, and and I do have to tell you though, I've never heard of an academic career advisor, so um, <laughs> I, I that is innovative. So I, I, and again, forgive me if you're out there listening well, to you. me jumping up and down saying we have one, we have one, but I've never heard of an academic career advisor, and I love that's a sociologist because my training is sociology, <laughs> and other than Chiquita Collins down in in Texas, mm-hmm. I don't know of any other. Dean, faculty development, diversity folks who are sociologists. So thank you for employing sociologists. <laughs> We're thrilled to have her. And uh, it was clear as a, a good fit from the get-go. And you know, she's helping us understand mentorship networks because you've brought that up a couple times. So I don't know that everyone would appreciate uh, it. Tasha Permanente, there are about 170 to 180 principal investigators to do primarily um, at the biostats, public health policy-related research, but some um, more genetic-based research. Um, and uh, there's that group. Then there's a tremendous effort in the areas of quality improvement and systems management. So though um, it hasn't been itself an academic institution, there are many people who would be full professors at many of our institutions just by virtue of the work that they do. So um, our academic career advisor, uh, Dr. Kim Bavong, is kind of building the network, learning from our department chairs and other groups within Kaiser Permanente, who are those people who um, we can either connect students with for scholarly projects or, you know, new clinical faculty who are coming on board to teach and have never written a paper. And they would like to partner with someone to 
develop an opinion piece or, you know, collaborate in uh, research projects. So I think it takes some work to get to know who your community is and what those resources are. So it's great to have an, a dedicated person who um, sees that as her mission. And they're hoping that'll bear fruit. And, and I hope we'll study it and write about it. So we'll share with you what we learned. Thank you. That's wonderful. Maureen, uh, you and I were kind of chatting earlier about just the whole the whole career around academic affairs and faculty development. And, and I think you wanted to share with the podcast audience some thoughts on, on for, for folks listening out there about, you know, no, none of us ever, we always share this, none of us ever thought that we'd go into administration and be a dean. And so um, I think you want to talk a little bit and share something about that. Well, you know, it's interesting over the years, and I'm sure you've had this um, in your experience, Kim, that individual faculty, uh, whether they're on committees we serve on or they're coming for advice in the office, said, you know, how did you end up here? And I might be interested in a job like that. And I think our colleagues who go to, say, the AAMC Mid-Career Women's Training or ELAM or other programs uh, will um, – often be looking to find that administrative career path. For those of us who are clinicians, being a department chair seems like sort of the obvious direction, but not everyone's going to stay and sort of balance a you know, clinical research and teaching portfolio. So I, I do think um, academic administration is this largely um, unknown pathway for those of us who go to graduate school, medical school. And, um, you know, there's so many rich opportunities and ways to have impact in academia. I certainly did not have this on my radar. And I, I often say that the person, uh, one of the people who was dean for faculty affairs before I was had been in the job for 27 years. And it's hard to have a job on your uh, career path that only opens four times a century. So, it's <laughs> that, uh, you know, well, when, you don't even you... think of it necessarily. <laughs> When you put it that way, four times a century, that is, isn't that, that is so true though, because we're seeing like my, my bosses are, are uh, the two people I most admire at, at Hopkins are, well, not, I guess I'm not going to say their ages, they would be mortified, but uh, people, are stay, <laughs> people are sticking around a lot longer. And so you're right. When you talk about mm-hmm. leadership opportunities, you can count, many of us can count on one hand uh, where you can go next. And especially when people, you know, mm-hmm. God bless them, are, are doing great and they're healthy and they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're curious and they're yeah. productive. And so they don't want to um, leave and so you kind of think, well, there's really not that many opportunities around here. Yeah, no, um, this is where I think the AAMC plays a great service for all of us because we come to see other roles that are possible in leadership at medical schools that would never have occurred to us. And you know, one of the things I always say is nobody went to school to do faculty affairs, uh, and that applies to the most junior person in the office, the you know, front desk receptionist to the dean as a rule. And I think that we have a lot to learn. It, it, in my experience, has led to a more democratized office where we really have the chance to pick people's brains. And I love when we hire a new staff person who's never been in faculty affairs, but comes in and sees our systems and processes. And, you know, they're kind of like bringing in a McKinsey consultant or something, because they'll say, well, why do you do it that way? And, yeah. you know, couldn't you try this? Um, so everyone really can contribute, which I think leads to what can be um, real uh, camaraderie in faculty affairs. I think um, being open to those opportunities, uh, it, it's a trade-off. You know, we have only our time to give. And when you're seeing patients and trying to do your research, um, it can be very difficult. But on the other hand, being strategic and wise about that, when it's a chance to meet potential mentors, meet individuals who would be in a position to create opportunities or be a sponsor, uh, th- those those are priceless uh, chances. And so I remember when I went to the AAMC junior women's faculty um, meeting, and I, I do not remember the scientist in the session I was in, but I remember she said, the best thing that can ever happen to you is when your chair asks you to do something that's administrative, because that's exactly when you have a moment to negotiate and say, I'd love to do that, but I'm going to need a 20% research assistant if you want me to run, you know, the promotion committee in my department, whatever. So I think that, um, putting oneself forward, taking those chances, and using that as a way to increase um, the support you get so you can balance it are all you know, kind of great lessons for a faculty career, but also can sort of 
be a springboard into academia. And then I think connecting with the AAMC to the extent that one can is really helpful. And um, one usually does that through official positions at the school, but they have, you know, the minority faculty training programs and women's programs we talked about and other kinds of opportunities. And I think that's where you meet your peer group and you really can get kind of mentorship I look for you and I getting to know each other and learning from each other so um, I think there are some ways to be strategic about it yeah um you're you're fading out a little bit so I hope we're going to be able to resolve some of your phone but I hope everybody listening has been able to glean the at least the the, the nuggets of what you're saying and I think what I um really appreciated about what you're saying is that how we you've been able to or we democratize our offices by virtue of the fact that none of us studies in this field and in addition to being nice how you said you know linking up with the double amc and and reminding us to be to be nice and kind and empathetic is that the other great thing about this job is that um it's a it's a it's a job. It's for for ser- for service people for people who have a, a heart of um, service and being a yeah. servant leader, mm-hmm. and and so if you, someone's going to go into this field, it's because they they want to help at this level. They they feel this need to serve faculty, and so I guess I was wondering. Um, mm-hmm. When you how do you identify this talent pool out there? Because I'm thinking there, are, you know, junior faculty or mid career, any any faculty member listening to this thinking, well, what would make me suited to this job? That can be every day is a new day. It's challenging. There are uh, lots of things that that happen um, that come down to faculty. How do you reach faculty members? And and I think you know, t- I, I as you were talking, I was thinking about some maybe a common thread would be if you find yourself as a faculty member. Um, always, you know, wondering with they I wonder why, or like you gave the example, the person who comes in and says, geez, why do you do it that way? Or um, mm-hmm. here's a great way to reach faculty, or I, I have a suspicion that faculty need this, or if only we could improve that, that kind of bigger sense of questioning, why do we do this? And why can't we do that? That, that to me belies someone who not only has a, a heart of service, uh, and also, they're they're looking to improve things and make things better. I mean, do you also share in that kind of a a sensibility about someone who would be good for this kind of a career versus someone who just wants to maybe look there an opportunist looking to buy out a certain portion of their salary, and this will do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think that. Um it is important that people have exactly what you said at heart of service. Um, that they recognize what makes them feel good at the end of the day, helping someone else in their career. Uh, if, if someone comes in and is looking for title or leadership, I do not think that's the, the phenotype that is really going to be successful. I, I agree. I agree. Um, it's a different, it's definitely a, a unique space and something none of us ever prepared for. So, um, observing and and talking and getting involved in the AAMC and being curious and and re- respectful of a culture and volunteering having you know putting yourself out there for opportunities to take advantage of um, leadership positions seems to be a, also the the a common theme or denominator with many of us. Well, Maureen, I think I'm going to, um, we'll let you go now. I know you're really busy and, uh, I know our connection from Pasadena, California to Baltimore, Maryland has not been ideal. Uh, but folks, um, you have been learning and being encouraged and inspired by Dr. Maureen Connolly. She is the Senior Associate Dean for Academic and Community Affairs at the newest School of Medicine, Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine in Pasadena. Thank you so much, Maureen. I really appreciate your time, and thanks for being on the podcast with us. I just love it and really appreciate being invited. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time.
The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.